Let's open up to, to Luke chapter 24 then and take up where we've left off. We'll finish up now uh, in the Gospel of Luke this morning, and then next week we'll be in John. Uh, John is the only, only of the Gospels, the only one of the Gospels that uh, actually has, has two two chapters uh, dedicated to the, uh, the resurrection and the, the final words of Jesus. And so next week, starting next week, we'll be looking at those, uh, John chapter 20 uh, and chapter 21. But, but today uh, we're finishing up in Luke, uh, Luke 24. Uh, and again, this series uh, is uh, the, the, the first words of Jesus, the first words that Jesus spoke after the resurrection. We looked at the last words of Jesus, uh, the final words of Jesus, the last seven statements that he made were on the cross. We're, on, we're, we're at Calvary. Uh, but, but after that, then he, he is resurrected, and we take up then uh, in Matthew chapter 28, in Mark chapter 16, in Luke chapter 24, and then in John chapter 20 and 21, the first interactions that he has with humans uh, after his resurrection. And so we took up here in Luke 24 that how in the first 12 verses we see the resurrection. We see the stone rolled away. We see the angels saying, why do you seek the living among the dead? We see him, uh, him saying in verse 6, he is not here, he's risen. Uh, and then we started in verse 13. We went all the way down through verse 35, and, and that's the road to Emmaus, the longest single portion of Scripture dedicated to Jesus' interaction at any one time with, with, with two people. And, and, and he's walking with these two people. And one of the verses that, that really stands out to me was when he said in verse, it says in verse 27, and beginning at Moses, and beginning at Moses. Now, where does Moses begin? That'd be the book of Genesis. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's called the Pentateuch. Those five books, all young Jewish boys were required to know the Pentateuch and have it memorized, know it by heart by the time they were 12 years old. And think about that. Think about that the next time that uh, you think about, you know, well, pastor said we should all memorize a verse once a week. You know, have a new verse every day and just read our Bibles in the morning and, and just pick out one verse and commit it to memory so that by the end of the day, I've memorized it, I've pondered it, I've rolled it over in my mind, I've meditated on it until I've committed it to memory. And boy, that sure seems like a lot of work. Well, they, 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 did quite a bit of work to, to know their Bible and understand the law. And, and it was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they'd know that by the time they were 12 years old by heart. They'd recite it completely. Of course, Jesus went beyond that. When he was 12 years old, he astonished them by his knowledge of the Bible. Who's them? The doctors of the law, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers, those that were in the temple. And, and they, were, they were astonished at his knowledge of the scriptures. And so it had to go far beyond that. He answered their questions, and then he asked them questions they couldn't answer at, at 12 years of age. Well... He, in verse 27, these are the two men he's walking with, and it says, beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now think about that. Uh, if, 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 if the estimates uh, are correct, there are over 400 references to Christ in the Old Testament, 400, and it doesn't say he quoted them, it says he expounded them. That means he commented on each one. You think my sermons are long. <laughs> Pastor, you use like 20 to 30 scriptures every time we come together. 400 in one sermon, and they were standing up the whole time. They were walking the whole time, seven and a half mile journey, they're walking, and he expounds hundreds of, of scriptures, and that was the only Bible they had. They didn't have the Gospels. They didn't have the book of Acts. They didn't have the epistles, the letters of the church. They didn't have the pastoral epistles. They didn't have the book of Revelation. They had Genesis through Malachi. 
and he expounded. It doesn't say most. It doesn't say some. It says all the scriptures concerning himself. That was one powerful message. And then after their eyes were opened in verse 31, and they recognized him, then it says in verse 32, didn't our hearts burn within us while he talked with us in the way and while he opened to us the scriptures, while he explained the scriptures, while he explained what they meant. And then they went and they said, we've seen the Lord. And the others said, we've seen him too. And verse 36, he was there. He, he, he was there right there in the midst of them. He, he showed them his hands and feet. In verse 39, he said, handle me, touch me. They thought he was a ghost or a spirit. And he said, flesh and bones, uh, a spirit does not have, as you see that I have. And we notice in that 39th verse that he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And it didn't say blood. Because the scriptures say he poured out his blood, all of it. He poured his blood out as an eternal redemptive sacrifice for us. See, when, when in the Old Testament, precursor, a, a, a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ was the Passover lamb. And in the book of Exodus, they are commanded. Now, before you come out, this lamb has to die. Death is going to come through Egypt, and all the firstborn will die. But whoever's house is covered by the blood of that sacrifice, death will pass over, and you will go out free. And, 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 and that's all a foreshadowing of, of Christ. It was never God's plan that throughout all of human history that lambs would die. That was a foreshadowing of his son who was called the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. And, and that little lamb then would be slain and they would, they would take every last drop of blood from that lamb. Every drop. Now when Jesus was sacrificed, what day was it on? It was right at the Passover. It was right on the moment of sacrifice when the lamb would be slain and that's exactly when he was hanging on the cross. And he was hanging there right when that lamb was to be slain and, 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 and shedding all of its blood for the remission of their sins and for the covering so that death might pass by and pass over them. And so he goes, he now is that after the resurrections, after his death, after his, his uh, uh, burial, after his resurrection, and he says in verse 39, behold my hands, my feet, they can see the wounds, they can see the holes, and, and he says, handle me, go ahead, touch me, uh, and, and you can see I'm not a ghost, this isn't a spirit. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I have. He didn't say flesh and blood. He said flesh and bones. Blood has already been spilled, already been presented in heaven, already been shed for you and I. Verse 40, when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they believed not for joy and wondered, he said, have you had, do you have any meat? Do you have anything to eat here? You got anything to eat? Sounds like us going to grandma's house. When we were kids. You got anything to eat? Yeah. Grandma always baked. Man. <sighs> How can you make cake frosting that tastes that good? She'd make those cakes, chocolate cake with white frosting. That's my favorite. Or white cake with chocolate frosting. That was my favorite, too. Didn't matter what Grandma made. It was always cinnamon rolls. Lord, have mercy. Cookies all the time. Pies. And, and so, you know, hi, Grandma, we love you. Got anything to eat? That, that was just, well, Jesus asked them. You know, they're still not quite grasping the fact that it's really him. They think they're seeing a vision. They think they're seeing some kind of an apparition. They think maybe he's a ghost. And he's, he's saying, what do you got to eat around here? What do you have to eat around here? And it says they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb. And so, like I say, Jesus believes in dessert. <laughs> Something sweet. Something sweet after you, I mean, all right, so, so they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it and ate it, and ate it before them, and said to them, he's, he's, he's not hungry, he's just, he's just settling them, because they're, they're just having a really hard time processing this, really hard time processing, you know, just getting this, that, that it's really him. You know, sometimes Christians, you know, like in oh, 2018, you know, they just have a real, they just have a difficult time processing the fact that, you know, you'll, 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 we talk about prayer and you talk about having a Savior. 
and you talk about having a Lord, and you talk about having a God, and, and, and it's just some kind of precept. It's just some, some, kind of, some kind of thought process out there in the stratosphere somewhere. And, and, and they say, well, no, 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 no. You know, I just need somebody real. And you say, well, he is real. Yeah. Well, I just need like a real person. He is a real person. Well, I mean one that exists. He does exist. Yeah. He just really does. He really, really does. And I imagine if, if the Lord would just, you know, all of a sudden just appear standing over here, that there'd be people that, that, that they'd, is this a vision? Is this a dream? Is this some, some kind of hologram? You know, did pastor do this? Is, is this, you know, and he, he just, you got anything to eat? And, and, and that's what he's doing to them. He's, he's just, he's, he's trying to help them get it. This is me. I'm really standing right here. Touch me, okay? Still struggling. Okay, got anything to eat? Uh, and 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 now he's gonna now he's gonna begin to speak to them, and he says in verse forty four, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, that's the Pentateuch, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. All things. Not 398, not 399, but all 400. Everything written in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <coughs> everything written in the Psalms. And everything written in the Prophets. Everything written about me must be fulfilled. And every bit of it was. Every single solitary thing that the Old Testament speaks about Christ was fulfilled. They didn't get to the end. They didn't get to this point and say, oh, hang on, guys. Heavenly Father, we forgot about that one. We forgot about that one. That... No, there wasn't, there wasn't even one. There wasn't even one. How could that possibly happen with the kind of odds that we described before? How could it possibly happen? How could it possibly come to pass? There is only one single solitary explanation, and that is God, the God who is unlimited, the God who is unfathomable in his mode of existence and whose wisdom is limitless and whose knowledge and understanding is, is beyond our comprehension, that he would will it to be and that his hand was both in creation and in every single page of the scriptures that all scripture was given by inspiration of God. It wasn't a fact that they prophesied it in the first millennium and in the second millennium and in the third millennium and in the fourth millennium and in those thousand year periods that, that, that prophets spoke, that the psalmists wrote, uh, and, and that recorders of scriptures, uh, uh, they just wrote it down. And then somehow Jesus in 33 years had to run around going, oh, Oh, I gotta fulfill this one. Oh, I gotta fulfill that one. Oh, I gotta find a, find a way to fulfill that one. No, I gotta run over here and I gotta find a way to do this. And then I have to do that as well. No, no, no. No, that, 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 see, many of these prophecies have to do with other people. Yeah. One of the prophecies had to do with Judas, the one who would betray him, who would lift up his heel, the one who broke bread with him, but who then turned his enemies against him. The Bible even prophesied a thousand years before it happened what the betrayal price would be. Now, Jesus didn't walk over and say, hey, make sure it's 30 pieces of silver. So we get that, we get that scripture fulfilled. No, no, the God who knows everything, the God who knows the end from the beginning. So you and I don't have that. We're made in the image of God. We're made in the image and likeness of God. But we don't have every attribute of God. You have to sleep. That's the easiest one that I can think of to utilize that, that example. You're made in the image and likeness of God. It says so on the first page of the Bible. He created man in his own image and in his own likeness. Created he him, male and female. Created he them. That's what your Bible says. But you don't have every attribute of God. You have to sleep. Meet us here Wednesday night and tell us whether or not you've had any sleep between right now and then. Of course, you have to. Your body will totally, completely, involuntarily shut down if you don't just go in and put your head on the pillow. It'll just shut down. You're created that way. But not God. God neither sleeps nor slumbers. See, your strength comes to an end, no matter how powerful you are, no matter how much you work out, no matter how strong, no matter how well built, there comes a moment when you just say, I can't go any longer. Not our God. 
our God, there's no end to his, to his strength. There's no end to his power. Isaiah chapter 40, none. He knows no weakness, zero. Our comprehension is limited. His is unlimited. He's unlimited in his immensity. See, and, 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 and one thing that, that God did not create humans with is foresight. We can have insight. We can have insight in how things work. We can get insight into our Bible. We can get insight into creation. We can have insight into redemption. But we don't have foresight. There's not a person sitting in a chair in this sanctuary or watching this broadcast on television that can tell me what's going to happen in 15 minutes. We can't even look ahead 30 seconds. We can think we probably know what's going to go on. I mean, pastor's going to continue preaching. And and we know that's going to be going on for like hours. But, but, uh, but we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't, we don't know what, what next year will bring. We don't know what a month from now or a decade from now. We don't, as we say, have a clue. But God, from way back over here, before there was even a world formed, a world before there was any created place called earth, before the foundation of the earth, he knew of a rebellion that would take place in heaven. He knew that the angels that were, that were mutinously assaulting his very throne would be ejected to a place called earth. He knew that he would inhabit that place with humans. He knew that part of that whole process would be that sin would enter into them and they would need redemption. He knew that his son would be sent. He knew that his son would take up physical form and say, prepare me a body, I will go do your will, and that he would be rejected of those humans that he went to save. He knew that he would be crucified on a cross, and on that cross that he would say, into your hands I commit my spirit. My God, my God, why is that forsaken me? It's all prophesied in the Old Testament. Because as that old, he knew he'd die on a cross. He knew he'd be buried. He knew he'd be resurrected. He knew his, his kingdom would be established forever. And that was all back there for, before there was ever a world ever formed. And so during the writing of the Holy Scriptures, everyone who was inspired by God to write, not by their own accord, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, no man wrote, no man wrote as his heart moved him or as he felt best or according to his own knowledge or according to his own beliefs or according to his own convictions or according to his own opinion. No, holy men of old wrote as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. No, the Holy Scriptures were inspired by God all down through the ages, through the centuries and through the millenniums to contain verse after verse after promise after prophecy. And every single thing it said about Christ in those scriptures was fulfilled in his birth, in his life, in his ministry, in his death, burial, and resurrection, every one of them. And he preached that whole sermon. I don't get to preach that whole sermon. I just have to give an abbreviated uh, uh, version. But I say again, I'd sure love to have Jesus' notes on verse 27 in this chapter and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. And then when he met with all of them in verse 44, he said, These are the words I spoke while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. I've prayed that for decades. I'm, 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 I'm pleading with you again to ask the Lord for help in that. Lord, help me to understand the scriptures. Open my understanding that I might understand the scriptures. Is it biblical for us to pray that, Pastor? Yes. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, it starts out by saying, Lord, grant me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you that the eyes of my understanding would be enlightened. 
And then he said in verse 46, thus it be is written, it behooved Christ, it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Now, we're going to go back and just take a few minutes. We won't, we won't you know, take, a, take all the rest of the day. But, but, but I just want to just give you just, just, a, just a taste. Just, just maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10% of all of the prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled in the life, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You might want to write these down or get a copy of the CD afterwards. If I go too fast, you don't get them all. But you'll remember many of these. How about this one? How about we'll just start with this one? How about Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7? Now, now we're in the midst of a, a, a building project here, and part of, the, part of the struggle that we have is not having people, you know, normally where that plastic is back there covering things, we'd have somebody sitting at a computer. And, and we'd have screens. We don't even have screens, let alone they're not down. But, but I think right now, uh, I think how relieved the people that normally run that computer are this morning uh, for not having to keep up. But Isaiah chapter 9, if you have your Bible, you might open it, and, and we might just go too fast, and you just have to just jot these down on a note, look them up later. Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born. See, we think of that as a verse that's on a Christmas card. That's exactly what we think, don't we? Hey, this is on, you know, a Christmas card. I mean, we sent on, I probably sent a text to over 100 people last year, uh, and that was my verse. On Christmas morning, I just typed out, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We wish you a very blessed Christmas as we remember the birth of our Savior. And we sent it out. Man, I was just popping those out. Maybe 200 people. I don't, I don't know. I, I sent it all over. I sent it all over the world. I sent it to everybody. And, and this is a great verse. We think about it at Christmas. This isn't Christmas. This is, this is stuck in the middle of one of the major prophets. This is just stuck in there, just kind of slid in there. And, 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 and it's so God can watch over his word and bring it to pass. And then later on, he can go back and he can say, well, it was prophesied. I mean, you can believe in me because God, and, and just go through verse after verse after verse, and not some of them like we're doing, all of them, every one of them. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. How is a child born and given? How can that happen? It's only happened one time in all the history of humanity. It was ha it, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, a child was born, but God gave his son. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. He was a gift from God. Unto us a son is given, uh, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David, who? David. Remember that. And upon his kingdom to order it, and established it with judgment, with justice, and henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Now, here's another one. Isaiah 7, 14. And we can just quit right with these two. But Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name Emmanuel. That, that only happened one time in all of human history. But it did happen. It did happen. And, and, and he would tell his disciples, he said, he said, yes, I am the Messiah, and here's proof of it right here. Open your Bible. The Bible talks about me. I had no earthly father. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and give, give that proof. All right, here's a couple of couple other verses. I'm going back to Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9 talks about the redemption of man, and he asks in verse 2, I know it is so of a truth, but how shall a man be just before God? How is man going to be justified? And he asks, verse 32, he's not a man that I am, that I should answer him, that we should come together in judgment. Verse 33, neither is there any mediator or daysman between us that he might lay his hand on us both. They couldn't say that until, uh, uh, they could say that until 33 A.D. And in, in 33 and a half or so A.D. at the Passover, there was one who hung on a cross, who was the daysman, who was the mediator, who could put his hand on one, put his hand on the other, and that's the way we become just with God. In Psalms, in the book of Psalms, now, Jesus referenced this, didn't he? That, 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 it was, that, that he was spoke of in the Psalms. And, and, and the, the entire Psalms, I mean all the way through the Psalms, but, but I'm going to start right in the crucifixion Psalm. That's Psalm 22. 
Psalm 22, verse 1, uh, there's, there's one of the statements that Jesus made at the cross. My God, my God, why has you, have you forsaken me? Remember when he said that on the cross? Okay, another is Psalm 31, Psalm 31, verse 5, and, and, and that quotes it. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Into you. That's one of, the, one of the last words of Jesus, one of the things he said on the cross. All right, verse 13 in that same chapter, long as we're there, talks about that <clears throat> they slandered him and they took counsel against him and they devised to take away my life. That's a prophecy of those people who, who were, were doing that behind his back and, and, and they were counseling together and how they might take him and how they might murder him. It's prophesied back there in the 31st Psalm. All right, Psalm 69 and verse 21, it prophesies what they're going to give him to drink up on the cross. I mean, you think they got together and said, let's find a verse and let's, <laughs> let's try to fulfill it. No, this was just prophesied by the, by, the, by, the, by the foreknowledge of God that they would give him vinegar and gall to drink and, and they'd put it up there while he's being crucified. Now back to Psalm 22 and verse 7. And they all see me and they laugh me to scorn, shoot out their lip and they shake their heads saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him and see he delighted in him. Now wait a minute. That's the people that crucified Jesus and those are the exact words recorded in the book of Matthew that they said when they were standing out there at the cross. They said, wait, 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 wait. Let's see if the Lord will deliver him. He trusted in the Lord while he was here. Let's see if the Lord he trusted in and we'll deliver them now. You think they wrote the Bible, they read their Bible, and they wanted to fulfill what was written? No, this is all part of the crucifixion, all part of what God said would come to pass, and it did. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart's like wax, my strength is dried up, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you've brought me into the dust of death. Dogs have compassed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 16, all my bones are noticeable, and they stare at me. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. See, all of this, all of this is speaking of the crucifixion, and it's an accurate depiction as we know from historical accounts, also from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's exactly what took place. That's exactly what came to pass, just as God said it would. Now, here's some other Psalms. I love this Psalm, Psalm 110, verse 4. It says, forever I will establish you as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. There was no order of Melchizedek. There was only the, the Levitical priesthood. And Jesus, it wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, appropriately uh, genealogy in his genealogy, he, he wasn't appropriate to, to serve as a priest. But what did God say about him? You'll serve forever as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning and has no end. A perpetual priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And that's exactly what came to pass. All right, Psalm uh, 41. Uh, these are the, the, the promises uh, about Judas. Psalm 41 and verse 9. Uh, and it says, Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, he did eat of my bread, and he has lifted up his heel against me. And then in Zechariah chapter 11, 12 and 13, it even tells us how much the betrayal is going to cost. And it says 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. In Psalm chapter 40, as long as we're close by there, verses 6 through 8, sacrifice and offering thou didst not mine ears uh, you have opened burnt offerings and sin offerings you've not required then said I lo in the volume of the book it's written to me I delight to do your will O my God yea your law is in my heart I've preached righteousness in the great congregation I have not refrained my lips O Lord you know several things there one that he told God prepare me a body I'll go do your will we know that came to pass he preached righteousness it's recorded of him in the gospels that that's what he did uh, I skipped over Isaiah chapter 50 when we were speaking about his crucifixion. But in Isaiah chapter 50 uh, and, and verse 6, uh, it states, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them who ripped out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for God will help me. 
See, uh, it, 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 it prophesies what it's going to look like when they, when they parade him through the streets and when they, when they spit on him and when they mock him and when they slap him and when they curse him uh, and when they, when they strike him. Uh, it says in Psalm 118, verse 22, that he'll be rejected. He's the stone that the builders rejected. It says in 1 Samuel 2, 35, that he'll be a faithful priest that the Lord will rise up. It says in Psalm 16, verse 10, that God will not leave his soul in hell nor suffer his holy one to see corruption it says in Psalm 68 verse 10 that he will minister to the poor in Psalm 69 verse 9 that the zeal of God's house will consume him it says in Psalm 78 1 and 2 that he'll speak in parables it says in, in Isaiah 53 chapter 6, 9, and 10, that he'll be rejected uh, it says the same thing in chapter 8 verses 14 through 15 it says in chapter 35 of Isaiah, uh, verses 5 and 6, that his, his ministry will include miracles. It says in Isaiah 43 and 4 that he, there's a forerunner to his ministry, John the Baptist. It says in Zechariah 9, verse 9, that he'll enter triumphantly into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. In Jonah, he is the one who spends three days and three nights in the fish's belly, and he said, in the heart of the earth. In Ruth, one of the most powerful teachings of the whole Old Testament, he is the kinsman redeemer. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. Two qualities of the Passover lamb. Has to be sin-free, has to be without blemish. He's the only person to ever walk the planet, yes, God, and yes, man, that never had sin. No one, even to this day, has ever successfully found anywhere where a sin can be attributed to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, that no bones would be broken. In every crucifixion, they broke bones except one. Except one. And I don't think the Roman soldiers were interested in fulfilling God's will and God's word. No, they just went out and said he's already dead. They didn't break his bones. And Exodus 12 and 46 says the Lamb of God that's being slain for the sins of the people will have no bone broken. That was God's plan. That was God's plan. In Numbers 21 and verse 9, he is the bronze serpent that held up, causes all who look upon him to be healed and to be given life. In, 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 in uh, I love this, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1, it says he'll come out of Egypt. But in Micah 5 verses 1 through 3, it says he'll come from Bethlehem. Now, how's that going to work? How's that going to work? Remember when the wise men came to, came to uh, Jerusalem and they say, where is he going to work? Where is he, where's the king of the Jews? Where is the one who was born? We've seen his light. Where is he born? Where did, they, where did they go? They went to the temple and said, where's, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? And we said, well, it's right there in the book of Micah. It says he'll be born in, in Bethlehem. And they went to Bethlehem and they found him. And they found him. And, and yet the Bible says he'll be called a Galilean. Now he's going to be from Bethlehem, but he's going to come out of Egypt, but he's going to be called a Galilean. How's that going to work? It's going to work because God said it would. God foresaw, God ordained the scriptures and anointed the writers of scripture to record it. And it's all recorded and it's all right there. And, and it all came to pass. He did come out of Egypt because at two years old, they took him down to Egypt. And then at 12, then they came back. And, and as Micah said, uh, he absolutely did come from Bethlehem. And so he came out of Egypt and he came out of Bethlehem and he was called a Galilean. Hmm. And I love this part. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6 says, He will be uh, of the seed of David, of the house and lineage of David. Uh, and, and, and those verses are, 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 are worth reading. I love these. Jeremiah 23, uh, 5 and 6. And it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name that he will be called by, the Lord our righteousness. And so he said he's going to raise him up, uh, and he's going, to be, he's going to be David's seed. This is also uh, prophesied in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, and Psalm 132, verse 11. Three times it says he will be of the house and lineage of David. He'll come from the seed of David. But I'm not sure how that's going to be, because in Genesis 12, 3, it said he's going to be Abraham's seed. In Genesis 17, 19, he'll be Isaac's seed. In Genesis 28, 14, he'll be Jacob's seed. In uh, Genesis 49, 10, he'll be Judah's seed. And in Genesis 3, he'll be the seed of the woman. Whoa. And he fulfilled every single one of them. And we can prove it and demonstrate it by looking at his genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 2. 
And through his genealogy, you see he was the seed of the woman that crushed the serpent's head. He was the seed of Abraham by which every human family on earth would be blessed because Isaac was Abraham's uh, offspring. He was, also, he was also promised your seed. Jacob was his offspring. Out of, him, out, of, out of your loins, all the earth will be blessed all the way down to Judah. And he was from the tribe of Judah. And we can see that right in his genealogy. Every single one of those prophecies are fulfilled. Now, we just gave you just a handful, not even 10% of everything in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, in Moses, and in the, and, and in the prophets that's written about Jesus. But his family line was prophesied, and it came to pass. Everything that it says about it came to pass, every single detail. His birth was prophesied. His, the location of his childhood was prophesied. His sinless life was prophesied. His ministry, even the fact that he would have a forerunner, was prophesied. That he would preach righteousness was prophesied. That he'd do miracles was prophesied. That he'd minister to the poor was prophesied. That he would be rejected was prophesied. That he'd be misunderstood. That he would not be accepted. That he would ride in on a donkey. That he would be betrayed. And even the cost of what it was going to be for his betrayal. Even the fact that, that the one who betrayed him then would, would take his own life was prophesied. That he'd be paraded through the streets, that he'd be struck, that he'd be beaten, that he'd be whipped and scourged, that he'd be crucified. What he would say on that cross, what he would drink on that cross, that he would redeem us was prophesied, that he would die was prophesied, that he would be buried in a grave was prophesied, and that he would be resurrected was prophesied. Now, we didn't even look at Isaiah chapter 53. No. Isaiah chapter 53 is, is, is known as the redemption chapter of the Bible. And the entire chapter, the entire 53rd chapter of Isaiah is about the Lord Jesus Christ and that he gave himself and that he would grow up in verse 2 as a tender plant uh, and that he had no form or comeliness that we, should, that we should desire him, that he would be despised and rejected of men in verse 3, that he would bear our, our, our griefs and carry our sorrows, that he would be wounded for our transgressions in verse 5, bruised for our iniquity, chastised for our peace, and with his stripes we are healed, that God would lay on him the iniquity of us all, that he would be oppressed and afflicted, that he would be stricken with the transgressors, that he would be put in a grave in verse 9, that the Lord would bruise him for us, that his, he would travail in soul, and, 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 on, and all the way down through, and, and then he'd, he'd descend and he'd make intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah. See, the, the, the entire chapter, just like the entire book, just like this. sometimes we read the Old Testament, we think it's poetic, we think it's historical, we think it's a good story, we think it's about the Israelites, we think it's about, we think it's about the prophets, we think it's about David and Goliath, we think it's about an ark. It's about none of those things. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. From the beginning of the book till the end of the book, it's going to be about the Lord Jesus Christ. People get so whacked out, excuse the, excuse the, 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 the uh, Old Testament uh, vernacular there. People just get, they, they, they just go crazy. They, 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 think, they think it all, it's all about them. They think all of God thinks about is them, and they, they think they're the center of, 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 of everything. And, and, and then when things don't go their way, they get all whacked out, you know, and they get offended at God, and they get angry, and they get upset, and they get mad because he hasn't answered my prayer and doesn't did what I want. You're not the focus of anything. You're along for the ride, praise the Lord. You just swept up in all this. This is about God's son. God's entire heart, longing, and desire, his wish, his plan, and his purpose is to glorify his son. And, and, and boy, we can get in on that. As a, we, we can tag along on that. We can hook up to that. And, and we can come right along and everything about our life can be to glorify his son. Now, again, I haven't given you all 400 references in the Bible. I haven't even given you 50, I don't think. Uh, but I've given you enough for you to see. These are some of the most well-known. Uh, there are others that are there, many of them uh, uh, a little more obscure. But these are, these, are the, these are the Christmas card verses right here. These are the Easter time verses right here. These are the verses that we recognize and know. And just think about that. The odds of even eight of them coming to pass are just astronomical beyond comprehension that, that there was a possibility of even one person 
bring in even just eight of these. But we have this, we have this, that, that his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, and his, 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 his resurrection. Every single one of those. Now that doesn't go beyond the resurrection, which even the Old Testament even talks about, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He couldn't talk to them about that yet because that hadn't happened yet. So in Luke chapter 24, let's wrap up. In Luke chapter 24, he couldn't even talk about the prophet Joel, could he? No, that hadn't come to pass yet. And, and, and so he couldn't say to them, and remember that scripture in Joel where it said he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh? Well, that hasn't come to pass yet, but it's going to. But it's going to. And, and so we don't, even, we don't even look back at those scriptures. We don't even look back at the, at the Ezekiel chapter 37 scriptures where it says, I'll put a new heart in you. The Holy Spirit come in, he'll, just, he'll put a new heart, take out that stony heart out of you and put in that soft, pliable heart of flesh that cares for others and loves and, and, and is merciful and joyous and, and, and peaceful. He, he didn't even talk about that yet because that hadn't come to pass. All he did in, 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 in the 24th uh, chapter of the book of Luke was he met with two men, walked along with them, and verse 27, expounded them all the scriptures, things concerning himself. And what he did is he opened their understanding and he said to them in verse 44, all things that must be fulfilled written in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And bless God, they were. But there were, but there also were some more promises. There also were in the prophet Joel promises that said, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy and, and, and your old men will see visions and your young men will dream dreams. And, and, and those verses hadn't come to pass yet. But even they came to pass. Everything written about Jesus came to pass. Everything. Absolutely everything with one exception. And that's his second coming. With one exception, his second coming. Now, I don't think that 400 things written about Jesus are all going to come to pass, and then we have to rub our chin and wrinkle our forehead and wonder if 401 is going to come to pass or not. Everything written in the whole Bible, everything written in the Scriptures, everything written in this holy book, everything written about Jesus Christ has come to pass. And one more thing is, uh, is waiting. Uh, he's already sat down. That's written in the Old Testament. He's already, he's, ar he's already sat at the right hand of God. And, and all that we're waiting for is his coming again. And that's promised. And that'll come to pass. That'll come to pass. Not mark my words. Mark God's word. That will come to pass just as well as everything else written in this book. Everything else. Now, there are people that say, that say well, he's not going to come to pass. And, and they're scoffers and mockers, and they say, you're crazy for believing that, and you're just, you, you just got some pie in the sky. You're, that's, kind of, that, that's kind of a little, uh, a, a little like a lucky rabbit's foot, something people carry around with them that, that makes life worth living and kind of gets them through the hard times. No, it's a reality. It's a promise. It's God's word. He'll watch over it. He'll perform it. Whether it's in our lifetime or not, makes no difference, makes us no never mind. We live every single day anticipating that moment when he, when he returns. And he is going to. And he is going to return. But what he did say, he opened their understanding, verse 45, and he said, it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. There is so much in that 46 verse that we have never yet talked about that why it was important for him to suffer, not just for us. Why was it important for him to conquer death, which is prophesied in the Old Testament? Why did he have to fight this battle? And it has much more to do with the entire scope of everything taking place than it does just humans. There's still a battle raging. There was still a battle raging at that time between the enemies of God and Almighty God. And that's what was being fought here just as well as for on the behalf of humans. We may get into it some other time in the future. Then he, then he says, and that repentance, and that what? Repentance. Oh, come on, come on, that's not a dirty word. And that? Repentance. I'll try this side over here. And that? Repentance. Yeah, see, that's not a, that's, that's not a curse word. That's not vulgar. And there are people today and in the last decade that have said repentance is not a New Testament word, it's an Old Testament word, and we shouldn't preach it in our churches. It makes people feel bad. Not if they do. Come on! Amen! Amen! Only if they're struggling and fighting and won't repent. Won't repent. 
I feel like pulling a John Osteen right now and saying, look at your neighbor and say, repent, you old sinner. That's a John Osteen, not, not mine. He would. He'd say, just, just turn to your neighbor and say, repent, you old sinner. Repent. What does repent mean? It means change. Repent from worrying. Repent from fear. Repent from lying. Repent from disrespect. Re re repent from being contentious. Re yeah, repent for being jealous. Amen. Amen. That repentance and remission of sins remission of sins now it doesn't did you ever notice it doesn't say forgiveness of sins yes. pastor will you teach on that for a few minutes no i'm past time already not today <laughs> we'll do it another time repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things so he gives him an assignment See, sometimes pastor will give a, give a homework assignment. Say, so, so, okay, here's your assignment. And people say, well, why don't you go to church and he gives us an assignment? We think we're in school or what? No, I think, I think we're, in, we're, we're Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus gave him an assignment. Yeah. yeah, gave him an assignment. And you will go out and perform all these things. This is what you are going to leave here and do. You are my witnesses of all these things. And behold, verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. See, see, he, he just did the same thing I did. When I talk about the second coming of Christ, it hasn't happened yet, but it will because the Father promised it. And so he looked at all these followers and he said, he said, okay, now I'm here. I ate, I had some broiled fish and honeycomb with you. You got to touch me, handle me, see my holes in my hands and stuff. And, and, and we got to talk and I got to tell you, I got to open your understanding. And I told you, now you're going to be my witnesses. Go out and witness to everybody. Go out and preach to everybody. Repentance and remission of sins. But don't leave Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Because that's the promise of my father. The father promised it. It has to come to pass. <laughs> Whatever the Father promised, it has to come to pass. He watches over His Word to perform it. None of His Word will ever return to Him void. He spoke it, and it'll come to pass. He said it, and it will be so. And it will be so. So He said, He said, now just wait here. Now just hang on. Now, now just tarry. And it took seven days, and, 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 and the day of Pentecost, and that's in Acts ch ch chapter 2. One through four, and the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a great sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And people come out and said, oh, these folks are all drunk. They're, they've been, they've been partying, and they're all drunk. And Peter stood up and said, these are not drunk like you suppose. This is what was written in the prophet Joel. Yeah that I will pour out of my spirit in the last days. That's in the Bible. That's in the Old Testament. That, that's right there for him. So, so Peter did the same thing Jesus did. He's quoting all through the Old Testament. This is what took place. This is what happened. This is, and, and Peter just took, a, took, took, took his cue, and Peter did the same thing. He just opened up, he just opened up to the Old Covenant, and, and, and he quoted from the prophet Joel. This is, this is all through the Bible. God said it. That settles it. It's coming to pass. And then he led them out as far as Beth, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, carried up into the heavens. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Amen. Now I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the last words of Luke chapter 24. And they worshiped him. And they worshiped him. And they worshiped him. And then they returned to their home full of joy. They returned to their farm full of joy. They returned to school full of joy. They went back to work on Monday morning full of joy. After worshiping him, there's a, there, there's, I'm full of joy. And, and they returned, but they're full of joy. But they're full of joy. And they were continually in the place of public worship, praying and blessing God. They didn't go one time and have a great time and get full of joy. They just, they, they were continually there. They were continually there. They were continually in the temple. Uh, that's not just written for their benefit and for us to have a historical perspective. No, we only need to just continually be in God's house, praising Him and worshiping Him and receiving from Him. And I trust you received something this morning. I trust that, that your, your conviction and your confidence in the Word of God and everything that it says uh, is strengthened and solidified and stirred and stirred god has never spoken anything that he didn't bring to pass he has never ever ever promised anything that he hasn't fulfilled 
that he hasn't fulfilled. God's word, you can take God at his word. Let's all stand.